Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today talking about the platform evolution. As uh, Dr. Lee introduced the concept some time back, uh, we're moving into a new kind of business model. We're moving into a world where business models are changing. And we need to understand the, uh, the advantages and the risks of these business models and how to operate in a world where such businesses exist. The reason the idea of uh, platform domination is important, I really like the, uh, the, the way the session has been framed as dominating the platform. The reason the idea of platform domination is so important and timely, if you open the newspaper today, this, these are all news clippings from the last three months. All of these news clippings are talking about big platform companies that have an inordinately high influence over market power in the industries that they operate in. These are uh, companies that are today some of the world's most valuable companies. Uh, the top five companies in the S&P 500 today are all platform companies. Some of them started less than 25 years back. Some of them started in college dorm rooms and have risen to become the world's most valuable company. And collectively, these four or five or six companies are holding the S&P 500 up today. And that's the kind of growth that these companies have had. But at the same time, what we've seen is that these companies have become the gatekeepers of our economy, our society, and our culture. Over the last uh, couple of years, we've seen all kinds of issues come up where there have been questions about whether Facebook has been affecting elections or whether Amazon uh, has been affecting taxes across the U United States or whether Google has uh, uh, been determining what gets shown and what, what gets exposed to the market and what does not get exposed to the market in different countries. So what we've seen is that as these companies have increased their power, not just over their economy, but also over society and culture, has posed new questions that we need to have answers to. And today, there are two different kinds of camps that uh, are thinking about uh, how to regulate these companies, how to think about antitrust. There's one camp that puts on the AT&T hat. Let's break up these companies the way we had broken up AT&T a few decades, decades back. H how we're going to do that, we don't really have a clear view on that, but that's w one group of regulators that's uh, thinking about it. The other group of regulators is thinking about breaking up the international landscape, make, making the regulatory landscape globally more fragmented. So you see the U European Commission creating its own set of regulations. You see the US has its own set of regulations. And different countries have their own set of regulations which come in the way of the kind of uh, business models that, that these are, which require free flow of data. And so there are different ways in which uh, regulators are going after these companies. Some regulators believe that companies like Amazon are um, as fundamental to the internet as sewage companies and uh, uh, the general infrastructure are to the real world. Because Amazon Web Services, for example, is something that is used across the internet. Uh, every time somebody uses Amazon Web Services, they're basically paying a tax to Amazon for using the internet. So when you have such inordinate market power, how do you regulate such companies? How do you think about antitrust implications in the case of these companies? Those are the kinds of issues that are coming up today, and that is why this topic of dominating the platform, understanding platform domination, is really timely today. To understand that, I started my uh, journey in, into platforms around six to eight years back when I started getting fascinated by what was happening uh, with the shift uh, in business models, what was happening uh, on the internet. And over the course of this period, I've, I've codified my work in two books, and essentially what uh, uh, was discussed just before this, uh, this session, the idea of sh uh, shift in business models. I, I, when I think of platforms, I contrast platforms with the way traditional businesses worked. Traditional businesses worked by producing a product or a service and selling it to a customer. So it was a fairly simple business model. You created a product or a service, you had a transaction with a customer, and that was the end-to-end -end business. There were three ways to improve this business. You could improve the product, you could improve the process through which the product was created and delivered, or you could improve the relationship with the customer and hence your ability to influence the customer. And so the business as such was very simple. What we're seeing today is uh, a, a, a significantly different business model. Uh, the platform business model as such 
has a completely different shape. Instead of creating a product or a service, it creates a central infrastructure on which producers from outside the business and consumers from outside the business come in and connect with each other and exchange goods and services on top of the platform with each other. There, uh, we're we're uh, facing a technical issue here, otherwise there's a very uh, beautiful illustration of what this looks like. But uh, yeah, you can take a picture of the technical issue as well. Um, somebody's actually doing that. But um, when you think about platforms, what's really interesting, thank you, about platforms is that they do not simply sell a product or a service. They create this horizontal infrastructure that allows producers and consumers to connect and exchange value directly with each other. What the platform does in this case is it does not focus on improving any product or service. It provides two things. It creates the infrastructure into which these producers and consumers can connect, and it sets the rules of participation. It sets the rules based on which good producers and consumers are rewarded and poor producers and consumers are punished. And that's how the platform enables the creation of value. So if you think of a company like Airbnb, it provides a common infrastructure. If you have a spare room, this infrastructure allows you to take this room to the whole world. If you're traveling somewhere, this infrastructure allows you to see all the rooms that are available in that city. So that's the common infrastructure that Airbnb provides. And on top of that, it also provides a reputation system, a mechanism by which hosts can rate travelers to say that these travelers are good, and travelers can rate hosts based on their experience of staying with them. And through this rating and reputation mechanism, the platform governs interactions and rewards the hosts who perform well and punishes or uh, pushes down the host, hosts who do not perform that well. And that's fundamentally how platform businesses work. They provide this common infrastructure and they provide some form of governance mechanism by which interactions can happen on the platform. Which leads us to the next question. What is it about these companies that makes them so dominant today? We heard uh, some of it in the previous uh, speech, so I'm going to run through some of these ideas. The first uh, it, the first aspect over here of three, the first and most important aspect is that platform business models benefit from network effects. If we go back to uh, this visualization, essentially network effects mean that the more producers on a platform, the more consumers will benefit. The more consumers on a platform, the more producers will benefit. As an example, the more drivers on Uber in a particular city, the faster I will get a car. The faster I get a car, the more I want to use Uber, and the more they use Uber, the more drivers come on board as well, and so there's a virtuous cycle that sets in. That's the single most important reason that platform business models scale so rapidly and end up dominating a whole market because of network effects. Because of network effects, they also, in a lot of markets, they also end up moving towards a winner-take-all model where a single platform starts accumulating the whole market around itself. What happens then is you can think of network effects as a way of expanding your breadth, your scope across the market. But as the market connects to you and starts coalescing around a single platform, platforms start making much more value and start gaining much more from the market because of machine learning, because they can now start going deep across all the breadth of data that they're gathering. This, in turn, helps them to start understanding the market better, helps them to start moving the market towards new interactions, and in some cases also has the danger of potentially giving them power to manipulate the market as well. Finally, through a combination of these two things, platform business models scale on the demand side. Using the scale on the demand side, platform business models also sometimes leverage supply-side economies of scale. Very often, we uh, hear quotes like, the world's largest taxi company does not own taxis, the world's largest media company does not own content, and we often think that platforms are about not owning assets. But actually what we see is that the most successful platforms are the ones that leverage high demand side scale to then scale up on the supply side as well. Let's take an example over here. Think of Amazon. Amazon started as a retailer, so it was a pipeline company. It was taking products, pushing it to the user, and uh, selling these products just as any regular retailer would. Using that, it started gaining users, it started gaining the attention of users. Post that, it started creating network effects in different forms. 
First, it allowed other kinds of merchants onto the platform so that they could come in and start selling their own products through Amazon as well. So Amazon opened out that side. But more importantly, Amazon started connecting users with each other by allowing users to write reviews of products. And the more reviews that were created on Amazon, the better decisions users could make about purchases. And so users started coming to Amazon instead of going to other retailers uh, to, to make their purchases because of the value that these reviews brought to them. Amazon has consistently kept on moving on strengthening these network effects. It, it launched Prime. Uh, Prime allows users to keep on uh, sh shopping with minimum friction, and that increases the demand side, which then fuels the net network effect further. It has now moved into our homes, uh, in the US at least, with Amazon Alexa, e Echo, um, as well as with Amazon Dash, which are buttons in your home to start ordering uh, uh, items directly. And through all of these things, it is constantly creating new mechanisms by which it can gain more demand and hence fuel this network effect. This also allows it to start spilling over into new ecosystems when Amazon Echo is used at, uh, at your home. It's no longer just about ordering uh, things from Amazon.com. It's also about connecting your home. And so there's a potential for a smart home ecosystem also to be built over there. So what we see is that Amazon constantly creates network effects on the demand side. And as it creates these network effects, it starts gathering data using which it launches entirely new ways of moving the market towards new interactions. Amazon is known for its collaborative filtering algorithm, where it recommends users to buy things that other users with similar patterns bought. And that's a way of moving the market towards new interactions that the market would not have thought of in the first place. And in that way, Amazon moves beyond just being a facilitator. It also becomes a market mover. But all of this becomes really compelling, because with all of this demand, Amazon then starts investing on the supply side. It invests in its technical infrastructure. It invests in its logistics infrastructure. It invests in warehousing. And like any traditional retailer, like Walmart, like Target, it invests in all these things. But it takes that a step forward even on the supply side. Once it has invested in technical infrastructure, in logistics, in warehousing, it then converts each of these supply side assets into a platform as well. The technical infrastructure becomes Amazon Web Services. The warehousing has become fulfillment by Amazon. And Amazon is now getting into logistics as a platform as well. So what we see is that a company like Amazon, if you really look at it, what platforms do is they amass massive power on the demand side using network effects. They keep on strengthening that through machine learning. And all of that helps them to get supply side scale, which they then open up as individual platforms as well. And it is this combination of demand side scale and supply side scale that prevents platforms from being dethroned. So let's talk about what this means in terms of different industries. We, we've heard about Facebook, Apple, Google, Amazon. Uh, we've heard about how these uh, platforms disrupted specific industries. But what's happening today is that we're moving into a whole new range of industries that have not yet been impacted by platforms. And there's a lot of opportunity for platform-mediated networks to come in these new industries as well. What has happened so far, if, if we were to understand that, what has happened so far can be illustrated using the simple graph. Industries that can be easily digitized and that have low regulation are the ones that have been disrupted by platforms already. The first industry that was affected was media. So if you look at media today, most media companies are commoditized. They depend on, Amazon, uh, on Facebook and Google for all of their traffic. And all of their revenues also then move to Facebook and Google. The same thing happened in telecom, uh, in uh, telecom handsets in particular. 10 years back, Nokia, as a product company, was the single largest player in the handset industry. And Nokia's business model was a simple product-based business model. You create 40 different kinds of phones. You preload them with applications, push them out into the market, and those phones go out to users. What Apple did was it created only one phone and allowed users to extend it into millions of different configurations by providing a platform. Even if all of you have iPhones over here, no two iPhones are the same because of the applications that you've downloaded, which customizes it as per your taste. And so instead of relying on a traditional portfolio, Apple and then subsequently Android allowed this kind of platform-based phones to be created 
because of which that whole industry got disrupted. We've also seen the same thing happen with transportation increasingly. In all these cases, what we see is that these, case, these industries were on the verge of digitization. If you think of Uber, Uber came at a point when smartphones started getting used. And the reason Uber came at that point was this, because the smartphone converted a moving object like a car into a digital object. If the smartphone had not happened, Uber would not have happened. So what we see repeatedly is that whenever an industry's critical elements start getting digitized, it starts moving towards a platform-based model. On top of that, the industry should also see some regulatory change because of which these platform-based models come in. This is where the next set of industries becomes interesting. What's happening right now, for example, is if you think of banking, banking has always been a data-intensive digital industry, but it's never been uh, platformized. But what's happening right now, uh, if you look at what's happening in Europe, uh, regulation has changed, and the new PSD2 regulation requires banks to start sharing data openly with third parties. Uh, it's called open banking. What that essentially means is that it's a level playing field, and eventually there's going to be high interoperability between banks, and we're going to start seeing platform companies come up in banks as well. Insurance companies realize that they can become platforms because they capture a lot of data about users, but they use it just to calculate premiums. They can use that data to start creating ecosystems so that if I'm providing auto insurance and if I know what kind of driving habits you have, I can then connect you to a third party like a driving school uh, to help you improve your driving habits, for example. And so insurance companies can create these ecosystems as well. Healthcare companies are going down this path as well. They've gone through five years of uh, digitization where patient records have become digitized. We've gone into electronic health records. And as regulation changes in healthcare, we are likely to see platforms come up over there as well. And the third set of industries, which are probably the most interesting today, are construction, heavy industry, energy. Uh, we have someone from, from Schneider Electric talking about this in much more detail uh, in some time. But what's really happening is that with sensors coming in, with machine performance getting digitized, with the rise of a digital twin for any machine, we're now starting to see heavy industry also moving in the direction of platforms. Every time an industry's critical source of demand or supply gets digitized, there's an opportunity for that particular industry to be reorganized on platforms. That's what we saw with transportation, with the rise of the mobile phone. That's what we saw with, uh, we're seeing with financial services, with PSD2 coming in and open banking coming in. And that's what we see with the rise of the digital twin in heavy industry as well. But all of this takes us to the next point that as platforms grow bigger, they are going to start dominating every industry. We're seeing Amazon do it to retail today, to logistics. We're seeing it, Facebook doing it to media. But, but if we look at the previous slide, we see that every industry has the potential to create its own home platform that starts gaining inordinate power. But all of this has a dark side, and that's why it's important to understand what are the downsides of building of uh, succumbing to a platform-based world. The first is that when we allow platforms gatekeeping control of a market, when we allow platforms to control an entire market, the first issue that comes in is that if a company in that market has a conflict of interest with the platform, then that company suffers in that kind of market. There's been research done which proves that Amazon often um, competes directly with uh, sellers on its platform by uh, whenever it wants to get into a certain category where sellers have been very, uh, you know, very successful, it acquires production facilities, gets into that particular category, and starts retailing in that category itself. And since it's, it owns the algorithms, it can easily move the seller out of the system. So whenever there's a conflict of interest, the party that is not a platform ends up suffering because the platform owns the gatekeeping control over that particular market. The second thing that happens is that platforms often bait and switch. They start with some policies, they attract businesses on board, and then they change these policies. This has happened several times with Facebook attracting developers and Twitter attracting developers and then changing policies over time so that their exposure on the platform changes over time. And this can, uh, this, this can be detrimental when companies start investing all of their resources on building for a particular platform, and then see their policy changing over time. A third thing that happens with platforms is that platforms also have predatory practices. 
where they can kill certain companies in their ecosystem. We saw this happen with Twitter, where uh, a company like uh, uh, Meerkat, Meerkat essentially allowed live streaming of video over Twitter. Meerkat became very popular on Twitter, and Twitter eventually bought Meerkat's totally unsuccessful competitor, Periscope, and shut off Me Meerkat from the system. So, so as a platform, the way Twitter benefited was that it saw that a particular category was picking up. It did not need to buy the leader in that category at a high valuation. It bought uh, a follower and then cut off the leader from its main channel. And so twi and, uh, what happens in this case is Twitter always wins, the platform always wins, and the other company always suffers. So we, as, as we start seeing platforms getting greater control over the market, we start seeing more of these predatory practices in the ecosystem as well. A fourth thing that happens is that platforms have uh, greater control, have a lot of control over the ecosystem that they mediate. And very often, because of the virtuous cycle we talked about, platforms end up encouraging inequality in the ecosystem. Imagine an Airbnb host who comes on board and starts getting five-star reviews. Now, every time somebody searches for uh, a host in that particular city, that host comes up at the top, and so his tendency to keep on getting five-star reviews and keep on showing at the top increases. And so his ability to keep on making more money also increases. Whereas somebody else who's coming up and does not have any reviews yet gets crowded out of the system, and so very soon what happens in this kind of a scenario is that the rich keep getting richer and the poor keep getting poorer. Now, in the case of Airbnb, this may sound like it's happening in a corner, but if you think of what's happening in China right now, the whole country has launched a rating system for the citizens. If that rating system is not managed well, it can, instead of helping, it can re lead to these kind of unintended consequences of inequality across the country. We also see platforms having a sim similar impact on culture. Because of feedback loops, platforms, just as they make the, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, they also Ensure, they also move our thinking into more polarized outcomes. And that is why very often when we are on social media, we end up seeing more of what we want to see, and that ends up polarizing our various instincts. Because of this, today there's a lot of question about the role of platforms on the outcome of elections around the world. And so when we look at all of these things, we see that platforms have a lot of power in terms of the kind of outcomes that others in, the, in their particular industry uh, may have once a platform comes in. There are two kinds of things that happen to other companies when platforms come in. First, platforms do not just compete directly, they compete laterally. If you are building a product, you compete directly. So if you are selling that particular dish that was shown earlier, it competes with other kinds of food. It does not, for example, compete with medicines or with hammers. What happens with platforms is that because they collect data, they can move into, into totally different industries without any warning. And this, this has already happened in several cases in the past. And right now, in healthcare, this is happening uh, in a very big way where uh, traditional hospitals are competing with companies like Apple and Google, which are also getting into health. They're competing with new wearables companies like Jawbone, and they're comp competing with uh, electronics companies like Philips, all of which are getting healthcare data and trying to move after the same end customer. So one of the things that uh, you need to watch out for in a world of platforms is watch out for lateral competition. The other thing that's important in a world of platforms is that once a platform wins, most other players in the ecosystem get commoditized. Traditionally, brands had a lot of power. You could create a brand and influence the user based on that. But today, users go to Google, they go to Amazon to search for things, and they totally bypass the brand. They search for the category and end up buying whatever makes most sense based on the reviews on Amazon. So the brand gets commoditized. This commoditization in increases even further as more uh, AI comes into the interface. For example, if you have a voice assistant, a voice assistant commoditizes the brand even more because you just ask for a particular category and the assistant recommends one particular product out of that category. So what's important in this case is for brands to figure out ways to differentiate themselves, and very often that involves gaining a direct relationship with their users, getting data about them, and personalizing the experience with their users as well. So over time, brands will have to start differentiating rather than working on the traditional branding principles, because those are getting commoditized. 
Finally, the question that all of us uh, have to think about today is, do platform or not? Not every company can be a platform. But what's important for companies that are not becoming platforms is to ensure that, one, you do not get commoditized in an ecosystem. You do not play in an ecosystem which encourages a high level of competition with, within your category. Instead, two, you move into other kinds of you move into partnering with platforms that do not commoditize that particular ecosystem. Let's take an example over here. If you think of Facebook, Facebook commoditizes media companies because media companies all end up directly competing with Facebook. But Facebook does not commoditize Starbucks. Starbucks has a very uh, popular page on Facebook, which then allows Starbucks to engage users and move them to another business model that does not compete with Facebook. So the opportunity that companies have in a platform world is to ensure that they work on platforms that do not compete directly with their traditional based business model. And finally, in addition to doing just that, it's also important that brands start establishing a direct relationship with users get data about users that they uniquely own so that eventually they also have the ability to start moving in the direction of platforms because of this unique data that they have about users. As I sh showed earlier today, a lot of this is becoming important because platforms are no longer just happening in one or two industries. They're going to come in and mediate markets across industries. And that's why it's extremely important for us to think today about the implications of dominating the platform. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you.